First, I want to thank uh, Professor Matt Cartmill and Kay Brown for organizing uh, yet another successful session, hopefully. Certainly, the webcast went well. And we'll see for the next hour and a half how things go. Um, I also want to introduce uh, our panel here. Uh, on my uh, far right, on your left, is Professor Cheryl Knott here at Boston University. Uh, to my right is one of our visiting uh, uh, scholars, uh, Mike Plavkin at the University of Arkansas. Uh, I'm Jeremy De Silva, a professor here at BU. Uh, to my left is Phil Reno, uh, who's at Penn State University. And to my far left, of course, is Matt Cartmill, professor here at, at BU. Um, those of you who didn't see the webcast earlier today, um, we had a really exciting um, uh, pair of discussions on sexual dimorphism in early hominids, particularly in Australopithecus afarensis. And we saw two very different uh, interpretations of the fossil record. And hopefully today we can explore in more detail the reasoning for those differences, both methodolog methodological differences, challenges when it comes to having a scant fossil record, but also challenges in, in understanding modern primates and how uh, uh, variation we see in modern primates actually reflects uh, their skeletal dimorphism and also their canine dimorphism as well. Uh, something that wasn't discussed very much, but I think we will discuss much more canine dimorphism. Um, so uh, what I want to do is, is throw the questions to, to these guys right away and ask the question first off of, uh, you know, here we are all gathered to hear about sexual dimorphism in, in humans. And a question maybe on some people's minds is, um, who cares? So what? Why are we all gathered around trying to learn about this? What, what, what does this tell us? So I'll send it uh, to my right to, to Mike Plavkin first. Mike. Thanks. Um, in answering the question, who cares? Uh, for me, <laughs> I just think it's fun. So, but it, it comes as a, a surprise to me um, when I look and see where the stuff that I publish on, which is uh, male competition and sexual dimorphism, is actually published. And who cites it? And uh, one of the most common citations is the sociological and psychological literature. Um, there are, there are, people care about these hominins because they are who we came from and they are who we are. And so in the one sense, there's, there's a feeling of these hominins are part of our ancestry, and what we are now is a product of where we came from. And so it's, what we're talking about is really what is the basis of human nature. But then there's a more practical aspect of it in that people who want to study aggression in modern humans, and there's a lot of discussion of why human aggression, what is the basis for human aggression? For example, you'll find from the work of Wilson and Daly that uh, the overwhelming amount uh, or the overwhelming cause of, uh, of aggression, domestic violence in humans, and humans are very violent animals, is uh, sexual jealousy, males beating up on females. And even where females um, beat up on males, it is most often in retaliation for abuse by the male. Everybody agrees that this is a bad thing and we want to stop it. But how do you treat it? It's like a disease. If you don't know the cause of the disease, then your treatment may not be appropriate. Some people will maintain that male violence is learned, that it's a product of our culture. It's because we watch bad movies and bad video games, and you know, um, you know, World of Warcraft is going to make us all beat our wives. Or some people will say, well, it's a part of our human nature. It's part of our, uh, you know, it's hardwired into us, and that this is, um, it's part of our nature. Now, you know, some people might say, well, that justifies it. No, it doesn't justify it. But it does mean that if we under, want to understand why it happens, then we should know what the ultimate cause is. And so people take a great interest in what goes on with these hominids. Are we evolved from uh, a very competitive, um, sexually selected animal? And we see this sexual selection going on in modern humans. Uh, are patterns of aggression associated with um, uh, sexual selection? And do we see that reflected in the fossil record? And does the fossil record reinforce that notion? Or does the fossil record contradict that notion? And does the fossil record inform us that perhaps then, you know, our, our uh, mating system, which is an unusual one and very tough to figure out, has come from an entirely different uh, mating system? Maybe it's not gorilla-like. Maybe it's chimpanzee-like. Maybe it's unique and different. And maybe these patterns reflect something else. But these fossils are factoring into those discussions, surprisingly enough. And people really, really do care. So, and it's you know, all factors in also to the uh, idea of the evolution of human behavior. You know, where did our behavior come from? And, and dimorphism is the only anatomical aspect of our behavior outside of the archaeological record uh, that gives us an indication. Phil? Um, what I 
find fascinating is the fact that, I mean, we truly are unique animals. Uh, the fact that we are here discussing this issue um, at a university uh, is something that chimpanzees and gorillas don't do. Um, <laughs> yet, ironically, we evolved here using the exact same kind of evolutionary pressures, the same evolutionary uh, process allowed us to evolve into this weird set of behaviors that uh, no other primate or no other animal has. Um, yet, ironically, we kind of, by having the same pressures, we obviously at some point evolved in a stage while we were still you know, pre-cultural animals, did something very different from all our uh, ape relatives. And so therefore, studying these early hominid characteristics, such as sexual dimorphism, um, and many other characters that we can talk about as well, um, can allow us to reconstruct that, you know, that behavioral, reproductive, ecological profile of that, you know, very much a biological animal that somehow had the ability through the evolutionary process to evolve into the cultural animals that we are. Can I add one thing on that? Sure. You know, following up on what Phil's saying, there's, there, are also, uh, there are a number of people out there who are concerned with human behavior and chimpanzee and bonobo comparative models. And the issue with the chimpanzee and bonobos will come up as to whether our behaviors that we share with them were inherited from a common ancestor and have passed down through human evolution and have always been there, or whether they've been independently derived. And given that chimpanzees and bonobos show um, unusual social systems for mammals and a pattern of dimorphism, if the hominins were very, very sexually dimorphic, then it is taken to indicate that uh, some of those behaviors that we have in modern humans have not been shared with chimpanzee or bonobo, but the commonalities we have were evolved in parallel from common selective forces. So, so oh, Matt, yeah. yeah, I'd like to drop back to the original question a little bit because I'd want to, I'd want to uh, file a dissenting uh, opinion. <laughs> um, I don't think that knowing what our ancestors were like tells us anything about human nature. I don't think it's capable of telling us what we are like. I think if we want to know whether uh, uh, human uh, domestic violence, let's say towards stepchildren, has an innate component or not, we have to look at ourselves. It won't help us to say uh, that sort of thing is more common among Caterine primates generally. Um, for the same reason that uh, we can't tell whether the fact that I like fish is biologically determined by noting that my ancestors in the Silurian all ate nothing but fish. Um, the, the, the genetic fallacy is involved here. I think the real importance for understanding um, what sexual dimorphism was like, what mating systems were like in, in uh, earlier stages of human evolution is for understanding the causes, as, as Phil was saying, of the way we got here, the pathways that led to the rather peculiar position that we occupy among the animals of this planet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <laughs> any follow-up? Anyone? All right. Uh, so I, I guess let's, let's just dive in and, and, and talk about the disagreements that, that we have as a, as a scientific community on sexual dimorphisms and the pattern of sexual dimorphism that we see in the fossil record. There, there, we heard earlier today arguments that afarensis may have been um, less dimorphic, uh, other, other arguments suggesting that they're more dimorphic. Um, so why, why the disagreement? Is it simply, and what are the solutions? Do we, need, do we just need more fossils? Um, of course we need more fossils, but is, is that it? Um, or do we need to evaluate methods better? Is it, do we need to understand living primates a little bit better? Um, and then Phil's done work with genetics that I'd, I'd like to bring into this, this conversation as well. So this is a very uh, open question um, having to do with how all these different techniques are used to, to address this question. So we'll start with the fossils, I guess. I mean, I think one of the key important parts of getting an accurate estimate of dimorphism is uh, making sure that you have a large sample size and that you've, um, you know, because it's important to estimate this uh, population characteristic, because you're actually, um, it's a property of, of multiple individuals to create a, a size dimorphism or a range of, of, of size variation, um, that you have um, a sample size that reflects the actual population. And I mean, a lot of the initial, um, uh, you know, kind of evaluations of large dimorphism. Um, first of all, I think the human pattern, human, uh, 
humans like to see patterns, and so it's easy to see differences. It's not so often easy to see similarities. And kind of the earlier estimates of dimorphism um, came from attempts to estimate mass dimorphism. Um, and those were very good, probably, estimates of mass. Um, they required, however, um, you know, picking fossils that were presumed to be uh, males to estimate male size, fossils that were presumed to be females to estimate female size. However, those presumptions were based on size themselves. And that kind of, well, that gives you a great, you know, idea of what is the male and female size for ecological contexts or maybe calculating uh, encephalization quotients maybe. When you then take those two estimates and make a ratio out of them, that's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. So um, our attempt was to create a, have a mechanism that, a uh, method that therefore gave us a larger range of postcranial fossils to subsume within the same estimate where each of the fossils were treated equally as with regard to the statistical method as mm -hmm. far as their representation and their contribu contribution to uh, you know, the size statistic. At some point, though, don't we have to, have to assume what's male and what's female? At some if point, you, something has to be assigned, right? It, if you look at the different methods, it's, um, there are some people um, in the past who have assigned sex specifically to samples. This is fairly common, or to specimens. It's fairly common, but um, there are currently seven methods floating around out there to estimate dimorphism um, called BDI, mean, um, coefficients variation, uh, finite element or finite mixture analysis, uh, the method of moments, um, Sanghi Lee's method. And um, all of these methods, for example, the mean method is you know, when, you, when you talk about calling big ones males and little ones females. The mean method, if you, uh, if you simulate it, is actually the best method for estimating dimorphism, hands down. And um, it's taking a sample and chopping it in half and calling the big ones males and the little ones females, acknowledging that you're probably wrong, okay? But if you simulate that method, it works. Empirically, it works. I'll bet you any amount of money you want. It works empirically, and it's been shown by a number of studies my own and other people's studies too, that this is the best, best method for a single dimension, right? So if I take a skull length or a femur, femoral head diameter or something like that. Other methods can come up to equivalence to that, but, and it's not perfect. It tends to overestimate the dimorphism when there's not a lot of dimorphism there. There is no way around that problem. If you cannot tell what the sex is, you cannot estimate the dimorphism. The alternative is to estimate it on the basis of variation of the total sample, which is very much related to that method. These things are two very tightly correlated methods, and that's the coefficient of variation method. Coefficient of variation just measures the degree of dispersion, and assuming that males and females are equally variable, if you dump males and females whose means differ, the sample variation will spread, and that spread is now a function of the dimorphism, so it's correlated with the assumption that that spread is because males are bigger than females. And so there also is a bit of an assumption there, too. Now, the template method is getting around the size of the sample problem. The issue that we have here is you cannot measure dimorphism with this, right? It doesn't work. There's only one, right? And with two, yeah, you can measure the dimorphism between those two individuals. But if I do random sampling experiments, I'll show that, well, it just depends on whether you got a big one or a little one. You know, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. If there's lots and lots of dimorphism in the sample, right? If I take these guys, gorillas, right? And I take one male and one female, I can estimate the dimorphism because males are so much bigger than females that the variation within the sexes doesn't count. If there's a lot less dimorphism though, then it becomes dicier, right? And the less dimorphism is there is, the bigger sample you need. And so the template method is getting through a very legitimate problem here. Our sample sizes are tiny for these things. Most statisticians, if you bring them this problem, will laugh at you. Say, go get 500 more, <laughs> <laughs> right? Give me a couple billion dollars and maybe 20 or 30 decades and we'll finally get enough sample here. Or we can excavate all of East Africa in <laughs> a single excavation. But it's, you know, it's, we're, we're, we're slaves to wind and the weather and walking out on the outcrops and getting this stuff. So our sample sizes are small. So the, these are, you know, these all three issues. These are very, very legitimate issues. And so and, uh, at some point, there's just no way to get around it, right? Now, the issue that we'll run into uh, you know, with the template method that, that you've got is really, uh, we've discussed this earlier today, is that we're weighing a balance between mixing 
elements that show different degrees of dimorphism to increase the sample size. So what is the benefit of increasing the sample size versus the cost of increasing that sample size by mixing elements that may increase the degree of error in the estimate? So it's now we're starting to get into the real nitty gritty of the numbers and lose three quarters of the audience in boredom. But, <laughs> but that's, you know, if you see where the issues actually come down to. It's this intractable problem of sample size. But I think so, that's, a, that's an interesting question um, that, that's been asked by, by a student, is um, the, the difference in dimorphism depending on what area of the body you're sampling. And can that tell us something a, about social systems, mating systems in these animals or, or in, the, in the fossil record? You know, the fact that the femoral head may give a signal, but the humeral head may not, or, or vice versa, um, or, or skull versus postcrania. I wanted to ask Mike a question related to that uh, because he brought this up and I thought it was extremely interesting in his presentation on the webcast. Uh, you had um, one of the things that you, thought you, you suggested was unique about the human pattern of dimorphism is that there was very low cranial dimorphism but fairly substantial um, skeletal dimorphism in the postcranium. Right? Did right. I understand that correctly? Yeah, as far as I can tell. Yeah, yeah there was about 1 1, about 15% cranial dimorphism and 40% uh, linear skeletal. Uh, mm, uh, dimorphism. Mass. Yeah, mass. mass. Oh, that was yeah. mass. Okay, I'm sorry. Linear is 0, 05 to 0.15 if anyone cares for the Thank you, 05 to 0.15. Okay, um, what is the range in similar kinds of differences in non-human primates? You only showed us, I think, the numbers for pan. Yeah, the, I had a bunch of other slides in there but of this, and I have looked at it. And um, Now, if you take uh, within any one of the elements, uh, for example, gorilla postcrania, and you measure sexual dimorphism in a series of just basic measurements of the femur, tibia, uh, humerus, and radius. Uh, gorilla, the ratio of male to female will range between about 1.16 and about 1.26, which is a phenomenal range. The skulls and the skeletons, though, if you look within macaca, you look within guenon, you look uh, at uh, um, um, some of the New World monkeys, uh, what Adam sample of uh, this stuff. But if you look at a range of about 20 of these things. Generally speaking, the, the skeleton and the skull broadly match one another. Are there, are there now, exceptions? The skull, now, the, the skull dimensions actually vary a great deal more. So neurocranial dimorphism tends to be very, very low, whereas facial dimorphism tends to be much, much stronger. Right. Right? You can be choosy about these things because it's pretty easy to recognize you know, a cranial base from a cranial skull from an orbit mm -hmm. in the face. But, but um, if you look within other animals, a very dimorphic, an a not very dimorphic animal will have very low degrees of dimorphism across the board. It'll be pretty uniform in everything. If you look at something like macaca nemestrina, where males are just these brute, you know, leather stud wearing, you know, muscle monsters that, you know, God, and these these guys are thugs, right? And they have lots of dimorphism in their face, but hardly any in their neurocranium. <laughs> Yeah. And that's a repeated pattern. So where you find dimorphism in a face, it generally tells you that the, the animal is, is body size dimorphic. Now the skeleton will tend to track that to some degree. Now chimpanzees tend to have low degrees of, of skeletal dimorphism yeah. and they have somewhat greater size dimorphism. Gorillas, it's the same thing. Gorillas' skeletal dimorphism is around 75 to 90 percent, uh, equivalent to mass. But their body mass dimorphism is 200 to 220, if you Smith and Jungers are accurate. And their craniometrics tend to match this pattern too. So. In humans, though, we reverse this relationship. We, there are some animals where you know, the skull skeleton gives you a little bit different signal on it. Maybe it's a sampling thing because the museum collections were also slaves to museum collections and, and hunters. But the, uh, but the humans truly stand out in that if you look at the mass dimorphism, it matches the skull dimorphism, which is hardly there at all. And then you plot these things out. And in these slides, I had another one of these things where you just plot the human skull dimorphism. Boom, there it is like that. And there is the postcranial dimorphism floating above. And it's substantially higher than the overall body mass dimorphism. But in humans, it's associated with this lean dimorphism, which is something I'd actually never realized until not last year, until I actually plopped the numbers together. Oh, look at that. The lean mass dimorphism in humans matches the skeletal dimorphism. And that lean mass dimorphism reflects body composition dimorphism in humans. Females have more fat than males. Raising the issue of what we talked about this this morning is that raising the issue of are males stronger than females or are females smaller or slighter in their build in order to accommodate a greater amount of fat, body fat, and keep the same body size. So this is a can of worms, that Pandora's box that's opening up with that. And in response to you know, the basic question, too, of whether you know, do different features have different degrees of dimorphism, the most brute obvious case of that is the canines. 
Right? Canine teeth can be 400% dimorphic, right? and the post-canine teeth hardly at all. Right? So right in the dentition there, you have the, you know, an extreme example of, of variation in, in the patterns of dimorphism. Can you uh, pass, um, was it, I think it's the two femor femorite sure. there? Yeah. There so go. I just wanted to comment. So these, this is um, Lucy right here and uh, AL333-3. Mm -hmm. And um, they are actually the only two actual femoral heads in our sample. Um, and because we've used Lucy to estimate femoral head diameters. Now we also have a number of other um, specimens that might have been included in the sample. Uh, here are, uh, can you hold up Lucy over there too? Yep. So here are three distal tibia. One's Lucy, um, and then these are two other ones from 333. One very large one, one um, kind of moderately sized one. And they may have, there may be a different pattern of dimorphism, say for this um, anatomical site, the distal tibia, than there would be for the um, femoral head. So it's possible, I don't remember which, specifically which metrics are, but some of them are, in fact, more variable. And if they are variable, then there would be actually a higher level, say, of dimorphism within that, um, within that site. Because we're just calculating, though, the size ratios between, say, Lucy's distal tibia and, say, this 333-7 distal tibia, um, we're actually comparing relative size only between similar anatomical locations. Um, and so we're actually not really all that concerned with scaling to femoral head. It turns out that once you calculate any uh, test statistic, that rescaling to femoral head diameter kind of actually washes out of the, cancels out of the system. But I mean, kind of the cost is, is we aren't actually truly making an estimate of femoral head dimorphism. Uh, we're actually trying to look at the overall dimorphism or variation within the sample across multiple skeletal sites. And the cost benefit is, you know, yes, we're not actually talking about one particular anatomical site, but now as opposed to looking at, you know, two specimens, we've now actually doubled the sample to look at four specimens because we now have the other two tibia as long with Lucy's. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a cost benefit analysis, but I think the key importance is, is making sure we have a substantial uh, uh, size of the sample of which it is to, important to estimate this test statistic mm -hmm. and, this test, and to estimate dimorphism. Uh, Phil, I want to stick with you for a second and mm -hmm. keep on this theme of multiple ways that we address the question and, and ask you about some of your work that you've done mm -hmm. um, uh, in the genetic arena. Okay. And I mean, we've, of course, bones and fossils, but, yep. but what about DNA, you know, can genes tell us something about, right. about so, this? Right. Um, so I've, I'm currently working on a project which is a collaborative effort um, with um, other uh, people I did my work with in my, a postdoc with uh, David Kingsley at uh, in the Department of Developmental Biology at Stanford University and uh, Gil Bejarano, who's in, also in developmental biology and computer sciences and um, also with uh, one of his grad students, Corey McLean. Um, and we tried to do an, uh, and a project where we could actually try to combine, you know, bioinformatics looking at uh, comparing DNA s sequences to try to track those to actually differences in uh, the developmental patterns that kind of give us our uh, morphological shape. And uh, the project we we did is the um, through computer science and through uh, bioinformatics we were able to actually align um, the chimpanzee, macaque, and mouse genomes, and look for places that were um, highly conserved within the genomic sequences. And finding highly conserved sequences implies that uh, over many millions of years of ev evolution between uh, primates and mice suggests that they are uh, under stabilizing selection and have some function. Uh, what we did then was find regions of these conserved sequences that were missing in um, humans. And so therefore, we had an otherwise functional sequence that somehow we've We've, we've lost during our evolution. And maybe these losses of these sequences have affected our evolution. And to then test what these losses might role they have is we um, could actually clone, say, the chimpanzee or the mouse conserve sequence and look at what it does during development. And the way you can do that is you can actually look at when these sequences are functional during uh, mouse development. You can actually inject the, the 
uh, chimpanzee DNA sequences attached to a reporter gene, see where it's active during development. And um, I was particularly intrigued by um, one sequence near the androgen receptor gene. And the androgen receptor is, is appropriate for this discussion because it is, you know, the, the, the receptor that is uh, responding to circulating testosterone and is probably important in making these kind of sex specific and specifically male specific um, secondary sexual characteristics. And um, I was really hoping that maybe I would find, you know, the enhancer or the region that had been lost that was, you know, glowing and, and or ma making and expressing during canine development. Um, and well, fortunately and unfortunately, that's we it came to something completely different. And we where we saw this uh, enhancer active was in developing whiskers, and also in structures structures that we hadn't considered much, which were actually penile spines. And these are actually keratinized structures that occur on many primate and rodent uh, penises that um, are missing in humans, along with whiskers. And so maybe we have a correlation now between a loss of a actually genome, genetic sequence in humans and loss of, of some structures that may actually play a role in our evolution and, that's fantastic. and reproductive yeah. behaviors. <laughs> yeah, Matt. That's, that's terrific. I, I just wanted to clarify the word whiskers and, and use it to raise another question. We're, yes. talking, we're not talking <laughs> about the sort of whiskers that, yeah. that Professor Plovkin is stroking over there. We're talking, <laughs> we're talking about vibrissi, okay, yes. cat whiskers, uh, these, <laughs> these thick, uh, specialized tactile hairs that come springing out of your lips and your eyebrows and your chin and so mm -hmm. on if you're, if you're a dog or a cat or a rat, mm -hmm. which none of us is. So, um, but when we look at humans, humans are, compared to, uh, say, chimpanzees, uh, Remark the remarkably different looking males and females in terms of the epigamic features, you know, breasts, chest hair, the, in, these enormous puffs of facial hair that keep getting sucked into your mouth when you eat. And, <laughs> and, and, and I won't even mention head colds. So uh, what, why, if, <laughs> as your model suggests, you're, you're, the model of human evolution that you suggested proposed that there was pretty heavy selection for feminized appearance in the males early on, and that that was one of the things that led to the reduction of the canines. If that's the case, why have we got these remarkably conspicuous epigamic features in our species? Well, I wouldn't say that I necessarily selected for just an overall feminized appearance, but certainly loss um, of these uh, dimorphic canines. Um, I mean, what's interesting about the I mean, there have been lots of try attempts to explain the loss of these canines, and some have just... Mm -hmm argued for maybe for a reduction that correlates with disuse and, and others. And I don't find that very convincing because of, from, from afarensis, you can see that these canines have still very large roots from, you know, within their skulls. But the external part that is the display and the functional part that actually allows you to bite and rip the flesh out of another animal are reduced. And they're actually not even um, as sharp. And they're actually now also wearing in a way that they're wearing down at the tip through life. Whereas a, if we see from these chimpanzees and, and gorillas, they're wearing in a way that they are, or this baboon here, they're wearing in a way that they are honed and sharpened on the backside. So when they bite into an animal, they can pull right out and leave a big gaping wound. And these are very different from the canines that you would see in carnivores, which um, you know, actually don't rip out. They you know, grab and hold. Um, Australopithecines aren't doing that. They're wearing from the tip, which means that as you get older and supposedly more interested in being dominant, your canine teeth are getting smaller. Um, what I think, I mean, one explanation I think is that there's actually, you know, female choice is picking males that have smaller canines. And the reason why a female would maybe pick a male that has smaller canines was they're actually picking the males that are not good in the, you know, inter-male competition game. We're picking males that, you know, are actually the Casper milktoasts of the chimpanzee and gorilla worlds, because these are the males that are more likely to, um, you know, invest in a particular uh, a female and her offspring, because you know if they try to compete with other males only when say females are are fertile, they're going to lose the game every time. So if um, so, that was kind of the selection for for you know the reduction of the canine. On the other hand, as I mentioned, males. Um, females are also uh, have quite uh, you know unique epigamic displays, particularly uh, you know permanently large mammary glands, and and also this uh, pattern of concealed ovulation, which is um, a number of other primates don't display reproductive status, 
but even those that don't display the reproductive status still have different um, behaviors and say proceptivity or receptivity during their fertile period. But the evidence for humans is, is that's either a non-existent feature or such a diminished feature that it's not as significant as you'd see in, in other primates. And this would also uh, link to a, a pair bonded strategy where um, males would prefer females that aren't displaying the one three-day window when they are fertile, which would engender this kind of intermale competition for access to them to females at a narrow at a narrow window. Um, Mike, well, the problem there are a couple of problems with that. Number one is that in most primates that I'm aware of, uh, males uh, females don't need a male to raise the offspring. That's a human thing. Mm -hmm. um, Calatrichids, females need help. And they have males help. The females do choose the males, and there is some male competition for the females. Uh, females are actually larger than males in those things, uh, to some small degree. Skeletally, there's no dimorphism at all, but they tend to be a little bit bigger. And the females tend to be dominant to the males. But um, the reason that the males have to contribute is that uh, it's thought, if, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the calatrichids basically have such big whopping babies. Uh, I believe by my numbers, uh, if you were a Calatrichid, you could expect to give birth to approximately 30 pounds of baby in the hospital at birth. <laughs> that takes a lot of lactation to feed, and you can't do it. You can't do it without help. Now, in most other primates, the females get along just fine, in all other primates, in fact, without male contribution. So why does the female need to select for a male to contribute to the female? You end up with a chicken and egg question with that issue. Well, because they have a bigger baby and a shortened inner birth interval. But wait a minute. In order to get the bigger baby and shorter inner birth interval, they need provisioning. But in order to get provisioning, you have to convince the male that he's got something to invest here. And so you end up with this, you, you can't kickstart the system. And then the other problem with the humans is the concealed ovulation thing. Now, humans do conceal ovulation. There's no question about that. And it is a rare but not unique thing. But what really sets humans apart is not so much the concealed ovulation, but the continuous receptivity. Human females differ from other primates in that we are continuously receptive. Now, that doesn't mean that on Saturday night you go downtown and you find this massive orgy downtown because people just can't help themselves. You know, it's just, and it doesn't mean that they're constantly randy. What it means is that the female will mate with the male at any time in her cycle. Now, if you look at mating times, yes, there's evidence that females will be more receptive during ovulation when they're more likely to get pregnant. But if you look at the graphs and you plot those things out and you look at a baboon, right, female receptivity, right, when she's not ovulating or near ovulation, flat, and then boom, up it goes, right, and then boom, the interest falls off. You look at female and humans, eh, it floats around up there. So yes, there's variation, but proportionally, human females are effectively, compared to other primates, receptive throughout. And so this, you know, the, there's different ways to look at why that would evolve. You conceal ovulation and you not only conceal it, but you're always advertising it. And there is always a chance for that male that the female will mate, not only with him, but maybe with somebody else too, right? And she can do it. Now, will she do it? Probably not. Right? Humans tend to be pair bonded. That's modern humans do. And we tend to be serially pair bonded, but we do definitely cheat. And, Look in the news any day, you'll find evidence for that. Arkansas football comes to mind. Um, <laughs> yeah. But the, uh, you know, it's, it, 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 those things are exaggerated. I mean, you know, they, they make big news, but the, it's, a, it's an issue of contention as to what, you know, what exactly does that actually mean and what's going on with humans. And this stuff is really hard to study. I and mean, we can make jokes about what we see in the news, and the news distorts things. But you know, studying this stuff is incredibly difficult to do. But the real question there that, that comes down is it's both of these things. It's the concealed ovulation and this receptivity that the female showed that needs to be answered. Now, why would a female be continuously receptive to not just one male, but potentially to another male if she's going to select for a male who is not going to fight? So, and well, how does I mean, that work? Well, the two things is one of you were asking, asking about the kickstart of the system. Well, the problem is, is apes are facing this peculiar demographic dilemma. I mean, the trend of apes and of primates in general is, in many cases, to become what we call more case selected, more uh, interested in ensuring survivorship of your offspring and dedicating your resources to um, individual offspring. So we as primates, and this is a general primate trend, um, focus on one offspring, and we uh, 
uh, take that offspring um, through, and many of the primates do, take it through until it is able to be weaned, and, they foc and the female focuses on the one offspring. And then only when she's done weaning will she, you know, stop lactating and then re-enter reproductive cycles and, um, you know, mate again. Now the problem is, is you want that offspring to give the best chance of survival. So you want to spend a lot of time allowing that offspring to grow and mature, learn its environment. And the, the problem is, is the longer and more time you dedicate to that, you're resulting in these very large inner birth intervals of typically five to seven years common of, um, you know, of, of chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans. Now say you're a male gorilla, and you now have, say, a harem of maybe, let's say, just say like three reproductive females. Well, if they're only going to enter you know, the reproductive opportunities once every six years in an individual female, that means you only have a mating opportunity once every two years if they space everything out. On top of that, you have to make sure you're the dominant male through the time that all these offspring reach to reach the time that they can be self-sufficient because if another male deposes you, he's going to kill all those offspring and your reproductive success is toast. So maybe the, what kickstarted the system was realizing that you could actually increase the reproductive rate and increase the survivorship of a male over long term, uh, particularly investing in uh, uh, raising one offspring, further ensuring the uh, survivorship of that offspring, and actually increasing the rate at which you know, that female will re enter the reproductive uh, phase by provisioning these, like say, um, hard to find, high protein, high fat resources that are usually very scattered throughout the landscape that are very search intensive, that then therefore, you know, you can provide an aid that, that would be significant benefit to the female. Mm -hmm. So why doesn't everything do that? Well, can I jump in too? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's, right, yeah. we should probably shift to somebody who knows a lot more about primates. Well, oh, I just think, I mean, my, one of, one of my um, concerns about the provisioning argument is that what were they provisioning with? And all apes basically are self-provisioners. I mean, adults spend the, you know, all day long just feeding themselves, and so you have to posit some kind of very high, you know, high calorie resource that you could actually get enough of to eat, feed yourself as well as provision, you know, a female and offspring. So until we have, you know, I think changes in, in uh, human dietary changes, like whether it's, you know, you want to posit you know, meat or cooking or whatever it is, you can't really have provisioning. Well, I mean, you can find, go for searching for grubs and, uh, you know, termites and other things that, that could be big. Well, you termites know, provide very, very few calories of them. They have, well, they're they're high, calories, in, they're high in lipid, but they well, that's, very but those small are the things the that, But those are the things that are lipids and fats mm -hmm. and proteins are very important in kind of raising in probably mm -hmm. providing those fat stores that are important for re in reducing the reproductive rate. You know, find, yeah, finding calories is r relatively easier. And I mean, maybe, and, and you know, uh, quite often maybe a, 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 a female with an offspring, and now we're also beginning to talk about bipedal offspring, which means these offspring are no longer able to grasp to their mothers with, uh, you know, opposable toes, and so they're actually taking much more uh, uh, required care. We've given up on the arboreal environment. So, but maybe there's like a, a you know, a smaller range at which, you know, females could find, you know, some of the basic calories, but then a male could very much help her by finding those more diffuse, higher reward resources um, by traveling, you know, a longer distance and in more yeah, dangerous terrains. It's just hard to make the energetics of that work, I think, until you have sort of these more human-like food sources, especially, like, you know, cooked food or, or meat, I think. I mean, I think apes, the things that apes eat or that Australopithecines would have eaten, it's hard to, so it's hard to imagine, for me at least, that there would have been enough calories to, to sort of make provisioning. Yeah, selective. I don't but, think so. But, yeah, so if you figure out what they are, what those they were mm -hmm. eating, then that could help with bolster that argument. So what I'd like to do now is uh, have you guys start asking some questions. Um, there's a microphone. There it is. There um, should be two, one so, for each oh, side. Oh, two microphones. So please uh, wait to ask your question uh, until you have the microphone in hand. Now, the microphone, I don't believe, actually uh, uh, projects your, your voice. It won't seem as though it's on. That's OK. It's working. It's just mm -hmm. to capture your voice for the video that's, that's rolling right now. So um, let's hear some questions. Anyone? Anyone? Jim, uh, hold on, Jimmy. Yep, right back there. Hi. 
Um, I just wanted to make sure I understood your argument that you were saying about. Um, wow, no, I'm now I'm nervous and I <laughs> forgot my own question. Oh, oh right. So you were <laughs> um, you were saying that uh, we were ch that there was a trend towards sele selecting fem feminine characteristics of males over masculine characteristics of males, but I have never heard that argument before. Um, I guess, could you elaborate a little bit more on that or what, what your study is coming from? Well, I wouldn't say that I was saying that there was an overall trend to select for feminine characters. I was just more specifically about the canine. Okay. And you know, there's a, a lot of, because, because that is, has a unique or a particular importance in being kind of the display for aggressive or ag agonistic and, and, uh, and actually not only displays, but actual behaviors for primates. And it is actually the first kind of really hominid feature that we can at this point tell from looking at the fossil record. I mean, the earliest hominids at uh, six million years ago or older show some evidence of this canine reduction. So, um, and the, I mean, that's just one possible explanation is this aspect of female choice, but it's the only one um, that I personally see that, uh, you know, that actually shows a for directional selection for that. Um, but the other question is, is, I mean, clearly we aren't, males aren't necessarily overall feminized. I mean, we actually have a very different set of epigamic displays than females. I mean, we have beards, we have males and females grow hair uh, differently and, and to different extents and, and, and di on different parts of the body. Um, so there is this very much a, a further selection of, of, you know, kind of, a, of secondary sexual characters specifically for males and specifically for females. Um, the question though for some of those does come as, as because of their soft tissue characteristics, it's hard to know when those evolved. And the only methods we have now for evaluating them is, is attempts to look at what modern, how modern humans perceive them. And it's hard to know whether or not that actually translates back to um, you know, what is perceived as, you know, as as favorable in early hominids, so. That makes sense. So, Mike, I, I want to hear your take on the canine reduction because the dimorphism shift and the redu reduced dimorphism that we see in primates that tend to be more monogamous or pair bond is is slightly different from this. You know, it's certainly happening, but there's this other thing going on in early hominids where their canines are just getting small or smaller. So, what could drive that? And, you know, I mean, we've heard from Phil, but what are your thoughts on it? The canine reduction is, um, well, there's two things. There's canine dimorphism and canine reduction. Canine dimorphism can be associated with large canines or small canines in both sexes. For example, hylobatids have big canines in the males and the females. Uh, TD monkeys, Calicetus, have small canines in the males and the females. Um, canine reduction itself is complicated. <laughs> Nobody really actually knows why. Um, the problem with the threat model is that it's, there's no data. Seen dato. It's, there's nothing out there. There's no comparative study to back up that model. It has been proposed before. Jay Kelly has, has mentioned it, that, that maybe there's canine reduction for threats. Now, does that mean it's implausible? No, it's perfectly plausible, but there's no data. Um, female canines get big and small in other primates, too. Uh, if you're going to specifically say that females are selecting for feminized males to be non-threatening, then what about females that lose canine size? Because that does happen. And we've done comparative analysis that shows that female canine size varies with degrees of female competition. They get big in some species, really big. And we've documented female uh, Diana monkey that got torn apart by other females, shredded like, with other, uh, uh, like the males are famous for. Females do use their canines to wound. Female canines are reduced, apparently by that logic, phylogenetically, in a number of species where they don't compete. So why do they get small? Because they're non-threatening to the males? No data. Maybe yes, maybe no. We don't know. But the model that's specific to the hominins that's being shown there is, cannot be generalized to what we see in other primates. Hmm. Within hominins, the canine reduction starts with Ardipithecus getting down to about a female canine of a chimpanzee in both sexes. Now they lose the hone. The, the hone is, uh, you know, get a baboon. Uh, I, can't, I can only see the back of the skulls here. So <laughs> uh, if you look at the hone here, uh, the hone is this big, long baby right over here. Now this animal has a hypertrophied canine. The only animal that has a canine bigger than this, and it's sharper and stronger, is a saber-toothed cat. 
This is bigger and sharper than most carnivores, in fact. Most carnivores do not have canines like this. This thing is a beast, and it is well-armed. <laughs> and they're sharp. I mean, feel them. And uh, it's cool. Now, why do they hone against the lower premolar? Well, hand me the chimpanzee over there. They hone because of the height of the oh, tooth. Sorry. Uh, uh, Would that work? Uh, yeah, whichever one. Yeah. Yeah. They hone because of the, the height of the tooth. Uh, this tooth actually still hones against the premolar down here. And as you shrink this canine tooth down, its overlap with the lower tooth is reduced more and more and more. Now, the hone of this baboon over here is a dried feature. This is a specialization of these animals. In other primates, they do hone the tooth, but this is occlusal contact. You know, in dentitions, the teeth contact one another, and they do form a contact there, and it will happen. Now, eventually, if you get to a modern human, that contact will be reduced. Now, these animals will wear their canines at the tip. Why? Because it's... The canine's short, and the food comes in contact with the canine, and they tend to wear at the, the tip of the tooth. Other female primates do this across the board. It's, um, well, for some reason, my brain has, has failed me on this. It's called uh, incidental contact or, um, oh, whatever, you know. Phygosis? Huh? Phygosis? It, no. Oh, good gosh, no. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, anyway, though, um, the hominins reduce the canines to about this size in Artipithecus, right? It would be about the right size? I haven't actually seen this yeah. Artipithecus specimens. They're about like female. Yeah, probably. Yeah, you know, eh, maybe a little smaller. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and uh, then they do that. And then what's really cool is if you look within Australopithecus anamensis and Afarensis, they change to a human proportioned canine. They don't actually lose the crown height of the tooth. The tooth stays about the same size, but suddenly the proportions of the tooth change. The roots stay big, but the crowns now not only have shrunk, but now they change their proportions to the modern human proportion. Um, there's been a long sort of unstated uh, hypothesis that well, sometimes explicitly stated that, that canine, human canine form is associated with this canine reduction. And what you're able to see in the hominids is no, modern human canine form is not associated with the canine reduction initially. There is a multi-step or mosaic pattern of evolution of these canines involving both the roots and the crowns and the shape of the crowns. And the modern human canine that we see now is evolved after the shape evolves within animensis or uh, afarensis. It's achieved. Uh, and animensis is exactly intermediate between a female chimp and, uh, and afarensis in the shape, but not the size. So what does this all mean for canine reduction? And the answer is we really, nobody, you know, we keep trying on this one to, to say why it would happen. And well, maybe it's through disuse because canines are big and expensive. They get in the way. You know, having this thing and walking around with that in your mouth when you don't need it, it's argued, is problematic. <laughs> um, uh, it's been argued that it's a developmental thing. It's been argued probable mutation effect, that when you don't use something, the negative mutations tend to reduce the size of structures. It's been argued that there's a selective effect for diet. Maybe so. It's been argued that it could be because of a reduction of threat. Um, maybe. But then why do the females do the and so on and so on across the board. And you know, the best that I can say for the canine reduction is that it is one of the true enigmas within primates as to what the actual selective force is or forces that have selected this. Because maybe it's not. Maybe it is a species-specific thing. Maybe really it is because males, you know, females wanted males that look non-threatening. Uh, another comment on the non-threatening thing, though, for humans is that if females prefer non-threatening humans, then why do they prefer males with enormous upper body size strength? in masculinized features, which is the other thing that comes along. They don't prefer feminized features maybe in the dentition, or if they prefer feminized features in the dentition or are threatened by canine teeth, then why are they not threatened by large size and muscularity and aggression, behavioral Can I aggression? Can answer that? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> sure. yeah, fire away. Well, I think it's because humans fight with their upper bodies, and when, once we become bipedal, you don't fight with our mouths. Males do not bite each other. And I mean, I, to me, the association between bipedality and the reduction of the canine you know, seems like it's because males don't fight with their mouth anymore. And you have, like, you have a terrestrial animal, like a baboon with the huge canines, and these guys fight with their mouth. And like a chimpanzee, it's some, you know, it's reduced compared to a baboon. They bite and they pummel each other. They're using both their mouths and their upper bodies to, to fight. So it seems, I don't know, it seems, it seems to me like we need more uh, attention to how these animals actually fight. So not just aggression, but the way in which they fight and whether they actually use uh, their mouths, whereas like you know, these guys don't use their, their upper limbs at all for fighting. And what, and what's interesting there is following up, she has a, a really cool orangutan scapula. you got to see it in her. <laughs> and this orangutan scapula is damaged from a male biting with the canines, and because you, right. you saw it, right? Right. Okay, so we're firm on this. <laughs> okay, whew, behavioral data. <laughs> um, the, yet they, they have upper bodies, they beat each other up too. So animals that have canines 
gorillas, chimpanzees, and uh, orangutans that actually have upper body strength that are known to pummel each other still use their canines. Mm -hmm. So I would, if that's true, and I, you know, then they don't use it, what I would believe is that if you've lost the canine dimorphism already, and the size dimorphism, and you re-evolve the canine dimorphism, then I feel actually very comfortable with the idea that yes, they are using their upper body to fight, and now the canine is used for either something else or just doesn't come into the equation. And now selection is favoring other features for the, for the competition. So if these early hominins have re-evolved dimorphism, if they have re-evolved the dimorphism, if they're dimorphic, mm -hmm. then it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to re-evolve the canine dimorphism at the same time. Right. So I just have a hard time seeing how um, I mean, obviously, um, evolving the, you know, reduced time of agonism because it obviously, it somehow improved their reproductive success. I don't quite see how a model of all of a sudden reverting back to a very aggressive form of, of intermale competition in subsequent hominids that is more similar to other primates somehow sends us on this transition to being quite the very weird encephalized, you know, primates that we are. But that <laughs> depends culture. on when that happened, right, Phil? But I, I mean, but I think that was, you know, at some level there was, I mean, obviously some stasis, but there's some evidence of, you know, some increased encephalization, some increased, and also very much increased, um, you know, demographic success in australopithecines, because, I mean, they were expanding throughout Africa. And granted, there's the issue of that we, we can't find eight, many of the ape fossils because they're in regions where the fossils, where, where things don't fossilize very well. But we're still finding hominids in regions where you know other apes weren't going or where, where there had previously been apes, they had long disappeared. And so, I mean, somehow these early hominids were doing something that was increasing their survivorship, their, their um, you know, reproductive success and making them more visible in the fossil record than their relatives were. But the, uh... oh shoot, I forgot what I was gonna say. <laughs> well, while you're thinking, yeah, no, no, we have another possible explanation for canine reduction. This is courtesy of John Marks, who's an anthropologist, um, UNC Charlotte. He says, as any fan of vampire films is aware, it's awfully difficult to speak through large interlocking canines. We seem to be preoccupied with explaining canine reduction on a, on a given model of reduced competition from mates, but given some large canines in both sexes. Is it conceivable that the reduction of human canines has nothing to do with sexual selection at all, but is instead a product of natural selection for speech, which seems to have done a nice job of modifying other aspects of the oral cavity? Well, it's, so what about that? Well, one thing I think that's kind of interesting about that, twofold. One is, is that this canine reduction is occurring at a point where behaviorally our ancestors were probably very similar to, I mean, not necessarily reproductive behaviors, but you know, as far as their capacity for cognition and other things were probably very similar to <laughs> other uh, chimpanzees and, and gorillas. And you know, they're, as much as we've tried, we haven't gotten them to speak. Um, and uh, <laughs> uh, on the other thing, and so the, the gibbon model is kind of interesting because they, you know, have gibbons have these monomorphic canines, but they're monomorphic because females have have attained have become masculinized for males, and it's because they're monogamous. But in this reproductive strategy, both males and females are very aggressive at excluding other mates, uh, you know, mates of the opposite sex, to make sure that their you know partners uh, ensuring their partners' fidelity. The interesting, the other way they ensure their fidelity, their pair bond, is through their duetting of singing. And so they've actually evolved a very vocalized, a very you know, unique version of vocalizations, not exactly like speech, but that is very important to reinforcing their pair bond. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, I think there's ways, obviously, with large canines, you can still have some you know, very robust forms of vocalization. Also, if uh, canines are reduced for speech, um, maybe in modern humans, I, I, uh, the modern human condition, maybe it has something to do with that, but uh, Artipithecus has lost its canine dimorphism with a chimpanzee-like uh, canine, a female chimp-like canine, so um, I'm not aware that chimps can speak, so mm -hmm. reinforce what Phil's saying there. And, uh, yeah. So more questions from you guys. Uh, Jimmy, I, why don't we start with you? Uh, you guys 
uh, talked about uh, sexual dimorphism in Australopithecus afarensis, and I was just uh, wondering if you guys could say anything about uh, the new Bertelli foot that's been discovered and how that complicates the issue of, uh, I guess, figuring out sexual dimorphism in them now. It's a great question. Yeah. The other issue with sexual dimorphism is it's always been phrased actually as two sexes or two species. And this has been the constant bugaboo. Um, and we were talking about this and, and we both agree mm -hmm. on this. Um, there are, uh, did we count them four sites this morning? Um, uh, where, where they're pretty much, you know, it, when you look geologically, there are four sites that we counted this morning and somebody can correct us if we're wrong, where they represent a reason, you know, probably as best as you're gonna get uh, outside of an actual kill site of um, a, a temporally and geographically restricted sample of hominins. And that's uh, the Ramitus site, uh, Canapoy, which is where we work, which is a very restricted area, and um, the 333 site, and Demonese. And Malapa. So, and Malapa, five, 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 that was five, yeah, yeah, five. Yeah, I five. knew I was forgetting something, thank you. <laughs> and Malapa's the, the other one, yes, thank you. But otherwise, um, hominin diversity, we only, uh, you know, I always try, try to tell students that studying hominins is like doing a puzzle. You know, you start out with this piece and you think it goes over there, right? Until you find some other piece and you realize, oh, no, that was wrong entirely. This is actually a flower. <laughs> it goes over here. <laughs> and you, you realize, and what, what we have realized, I think, in the past, uh, say, 20 years with the, the fossils is there's a growing realization that the diversity in hominins is going further and further and further back in time. And that foot is corroborating that there's more than one species at that time in that place. And sometimes you'll see hominin evolution represented as the big Y. You know, there's this straight line anagenesis from the base right up to the split, and then you have humans going off in one direction, paranthropines going off in the other set direction, and it's really cool and it's simple to teach in an introductory class. But then we start to introduce all these other things and putting them in and putting them in, and they keep going back, and now we have Kenyanthropus and Aurora and Sahelanthropus and Ardipithecus Ramidus and Ardipithecus Kadaba, and now we've got this foot, which is at the same time at Kubi 4, we have four hominins in one formation. And we've got all these postcrania. And there's not a single head associated with those postcrania. We have no idea, really. We have to really start from scratch to figure out what's in there because it's always assumed that the big ones are, are humans and the small ones are australopithecines. But why? Because humans are bigger than australopithecines. And it's, it's a constant problem. And so that foot is reminding us that within these samples, we could be sampling more than one, one thing. And it's always been an issue. Now, the, the, the problem then you run in on that is that, well, how do you tell? Now, if the two species are so identical that you can't tell them apart, then it shouldn't actually make a difference. So, uh, for example, there are about t between 29 and 34 species of Gwenin. I think that's the number. I got last time looking at it, it varies. Now, if I take a bag of Gwenins, right, and Santa Claus, and I got this big sack of Gwenin skulls, and I pl plop them out there, and I say, tell me how many species, you'll tell me five, right? And there's 30 in that sample, and you can't tell. We estimate dimorphism in those things, it'll come out Gwenin-like, right, so it doesn't matter. But if we start mixing things up in little bits and pieces where you really can't tell, say we start taking a couple of baboons, a macaque, and a Gwen, and then throw those in, then we start to really uh, monkey wrench the estimates, and it gets bad. <laughs> so uh, that foot is telling us that, for example, with the, uh, with the Ethiopian material, it's raising people's questions about this has always been a question with that material, and it's raising people's questions as to whether these actually are taxonomically homogenous. But if you want to say that they are, then you have to find characters that you can actually use to show it. And until you can convince people that the range of variation is outside what is acceptable for a single species, then people will tend to lump them together and just say, well, that's what we have to work with. And you know, it's a constant issue. And that's why when we study all of this dimorphism stuff, this is all heuristic. Everything that we do is a what if. And it's always contingent on these problems that everything could change if we find out all of a sudden that, for example, 333 was actually a battle site between two different species <laughs> that could kill each other <laughs> often. You know, I, it's, so yeah, it's a, it's a real issue. That, what, it's a serious issue. What I think is interesting about that is um, I know the author, I mean, the authors of that paper were very careful not to make a taxonomic association. Yeah. <laughs> However, it does look very Artipithecus like. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting about that is, you know, um, from the arty skeleton, you know, other you know, with the foot, with the pelvis, you know, you can probably reasonably tell from many of the other uh, skeletal elements. Maybe not so much um, the well, no, from the hand you can. Uh, the hand, the leg, the pelvis does look different from Australopithecus. And I mean, I know they made the careful comparisons, and they, you know, if they could lump Artipithecus into Australopithecus, they would have. And so that's so the the, the skeleton we have from arty doesn't look very Australopithecus-like. And so if the rest of that skeleton went with that foot, we haven't found those specimens, already specimens within the um, 
afferents this uh, assemblage or hypodyme. Mm -hmm. um, but what's, what I find interesting about that is, is what it says about bipedality. And a lot of models based on, on why we've evolved bipedality have based on the idea that for some reason, bipedality is an, intrinsic better, an intrinsically better form of locomotion. And um, in fact, from personal experience, I can tell you it actually sucks. <laughs> um, I almost didn't make it here because my wife broke her fibula on Friday. <laughs> and, you know, that's a debilitating injury. I mean, it's probably a debilitating injury. It's probably a very serious injury to a quadruped, but to a biped, it's really bad. And you would then be leopard meat. Um, but so I go to what the sense that I get from that is, is that we actually often think of Artipithecus or uh, Australopithecus striding out into the savanna because it's better for them to be out there, and that's where the resources they wanted to go to. What this might suggest is actually they weren't striding out there; they were being pushed, because the forested environment might have still already been, you know, filled or at least somehow, uh, um, you know, still uh, contained these Artipithecus-like mixture of arboreal and terrestrial animals, and Australopithecus. You know, was therefore moved further out into the woodland savanna margin, where they really did give up the arboreal environment, um, and it may be in both. And so, I really think that the evidence for bipedality is that it really is a kind of a, a behavioral choice for that that animal that our ancestors choose to make, and for some benefit. And the only benefit I can see is somehow with with carrying something. Is that benefit? But Phil, the, the Artipithecus uh, material is supposed to be more bipedal than the average arboreal primate. Mm -hmm. So presumably there's some intrinsic advantage to bipedality that's driving that. And you're suggesting it's female, it's male provisioning, right? Right. Okay. Uh, which means there ought to be a, an ecological difference between the males and the females. Why would that not select for increased dimorphism? Well, that's what I think is... That, I mean, that's why that's what that's my explanation why we then see this maybe increased dimorphism in Australopithecus, maybe over Artipithecus. That once you've taken this to a further extreme, if as males to to successfully provide resources that the female wouldn't provide for herself, he would have to go on larger ranges. Probably, you might have actually even had, um, you know, males together because I don't I don't see how you could have individual pairs or even. Of, of a one male actually providing the, the protection to a group that, a, that relatively small, bipedal, slow, clumsy hominids would have relative to the other carnivores out there. And th but they would be subjecting themselves to both injury and predation risks uh, by, through this provisioning uh, behaviors. And therefore, I think, you know, um, now that we're not worrying about competition, we're actually worrying about ecological adaptations, and those ecological adaptations would be, you know, um, being better able to provision, provide, carry more food, and also be able to have higher a chance of actually surviving the trip. Incidentally, um, we're very glad that you were able to be with us today, but I think you might have had even more trouble getting here if you had tried to ride here on a horse with a broken fibula. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. yeah. The um, uh, with the provisioning thing. First of all, the what little we know about um, about early hominins' life history and their development is that they were ape-like, not human-like. So there, uh, you know, if there's any reason to think that they, they had a life history that you know, was one or the other, all the evidence that I am aware of, and it is thin evidence, of course, is that the ape-like life history is much more likely. Now, the, um, as far as, as, as provisioning goes, um, now let's say we're with a, a, a bunch of females, and we're out in the Mara, and you have... Um, you're going to go out on the savanna and get something for the females, and you're going to increase your mortality in your life history or your mortality risk. So I'll stay home with the girls, and you go do that. Mm -hmm. Now, who's going to end up with a higher reproductive success? Well, the the male that always comes back, and what about stays? the male who stays with the females? Well, because if you leave the females, well, because he the well, female, if you leave the females, and the females are continuously receptive. Yes, but then he all of a sudden I have an opportunity while you're gone. But none of them are showing their reproductive status. He, and so we're, we're not, he's not a sperm computer, so we can't. That's right. He can't so, mold, we can't so mold he with, he can't mate with all of them at one time. That, and, <laughs> and, <laughs> we, and. Actually, males can mate with quite a number of females. Well, yes, the refractory yeah, period is yeah, only about an hour. But, but, it, but um, uh, it, the sperm. 
Yeah, but it but it um, does uh, decrease uh, motility over just a, f a few times a week. Over, um, but still, the point is, is he wouldn't know which female to uh, mate with because none of them are displaying their reproductive status or or becoming any more or less receptive based on their fertility. Well, they become a little more receptive based aren't, on aren't, their fertility. Yeah, aren't there, female, but, aren't there analogs but, in modern humans? I mean, I immediately think of this as, uh, I characterize this in my mind as the milkman problem. Yes, it is, actually. I mean, you know, yes, there while, are. <laughs> while, while, while dad's away at work, da 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 da, -da, -da. I mean, yeah. and, and it doesn't take, <laughs> it, it, it isn't an insuperable problem to discover who is receptive and who isn't, even for the milkman. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I think it's disparaging that, milkman. Yeah. <laughs> but I think the, still, the, you know, the not being nocturnal animals, the, <laughs> the, the males are coming, you know, would be returning back to the core group. Um, you know, they, this, would, they would have, you know, But this gets back access. to ties into the life history. Other primates get along just fine without males provisioning for the females. And if these things had ape-like life history, well, what is, well, they have, right. their brains are a little bit bigger, yeah. but they're basically like apes, mm -hmm. right? And there's no other indication that there's anything radically like a human, like these things. They walk on two legs. But other than that, their life history, their development seems to be like apes. There's no indication that at this point that they have really long childhoods or that their interbirth intervals are particularly short. But what we do know is that males, when given an opportunity to mate with other females, will do it. Mm -hmm. It's in their best interest. I mean, it's a game theory thing, you know, that, that the male who mates, you know, who takes the opportunity when given the chance, will have the higher reproductive success. Now, if a male simply walks away and is out there, not just not there, but increasing his mortality risk, while the females are receptive. Now, you watch a baboon. When a female is receptive and a male baboon guards a female, and you've seen that behavior when they, the male just stands behind her. She walks two feet, he'll follow right behind her. It's creepy the way that they yeah. do this. And they will literally, they will literally follow that, that female and lose body weight to guarantee that that female has no opportunity to mate with another female. Now, but, other, but, ma other males do the same thing. They mate guard females. When females are receptive, they get very, they get very com competitive, and they view them as, you know, and that's when the competition happens. But that's males because don't fight a, over non uh, uh, But that's because when a, a baboon receptive female is rare. And so you want to, yeah. you, or when, or the, the period of which a particular female is receptive is rare. And so you want to be vigilant and guard that female. Then. That's right. But, However, if all the females are, have the same level of receptivity throughout the reproductive cycle, how true. do you know when is that right three-day window out of the month to invest or to right. provide attention to that female? And, so, and the only one who would actually have the benefit of that would be the male who was in her, was in close proximity with her now, why on would a the daily females, basis. But why would the females then do that? Why would they have that behavior to begin with? Because why would they want? To, why would they all want to have simultaneous, continuous receptivity and yet conceal ovulation at the same time to okay. get provisioning? But why do they need the provisioning? Well, because they want to increase their reproductive rate. Because but everything wants to increase its reproductive rate. No, and these some animals, like lots of apes, want to increase the survivorship. Okay, why wouldn't they want to? Well, increase they've been, and they've been, and they've been, they've so what these, what, why don't other apes do this? Well, they because they're because they were. Um, basically, you become trapped in a system where further, um, you know, for, where all the other males, um, basically, success is, is reinforced by being successful within the dominant hierarchy. Is it, so, is it relevant here that human females that live together tend to synchronize their menstrual cycles? That's, well, that's, that's actually not really that's not, been that's not shown. shown. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's a myth? Okay. Well, it's, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's yeah. yeah, I mean, some studies show it, some studies don't, so it doesn't seem like it always happens. I mean, it can happen maybe in young females, but I mean, some show, some don't. It's kind of one of those things that's like, eh, maybe, maybe not. Mm. But can I say something about it, actually, about, um, about mate, like orangutans actually are an interesting example because they are sexually, they are receptive, they don't have estrus, right? So what they do is males will, um, well males will basically mate with females whenever they find, whenever they see them. And in captivity where you do experiments where a female, well, where the female, the male cannot get into, where he's able to get into the female's cage and mate whenever he wants to, he'll mate throughout the cycle. So he doesn't seem to know. Whereas when, if the female, um, if they put the, 
bar down and only the female can get into the male's cage, then she tends to mate more around mid-cycle. But also the females are really mating strategically in the wild. So they'll mate with the, um, the dominant sort of flange males when they're ovulating. But when they're not ovulating, they actually seek out the unflange males to mate with them. So, you know, I think one thing to consider in these models is the different different male and female reproductive strategies and they have how they are, you know, playing off each other and, and um, but like you said, it has to be good for, it has to be, you know, what happens, for, what's good for the female and what's good for the male and how that ends up with the social system. Mm -hmm. uh, let's take some more questions from you guys. Okay. Uh, Robert. Um, so in one of your uh, statements, um, you, you say that uh, sec um, skeletal dimorphism does not necessarily predict body size dimorphism. So that kind of opens up the question of like, what, what are we really getting out of looking at these skeletons um, if it's not really telling us about the functional like, dimorphism in terms of body size? The argument, uh, the argument as I see it, that, that we're really coming down to with the afferensis material. The methodological arguments are, are a perennial problem um, with getting these estimates. And this is something that'll go back and forth. And, and lots of us debate these things and have different techniques. And we can all, you know, sort of publish papers and at each other and try and, you know, come up with a better estimate. But we really all will acknowledge that we have s some of the same problems. But as I see it, humans have lots of skeletal dimorphism as compared to their body mass dimorphism. And then you have also this tissue composition dimorphism problem. Now, if you take that estimate of size dimorphism in afarensis, and it's between a chimpanzee and a gorilla. Now, Phil and I both agree, right, that that estimate is, you know, it's between a chimpanzee and a gorilla. There's no argument over that. There are some arguments about exactly what the magnitude is and, you know, the accuracy of the methods one way or the other. But if the, 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 the real problem here is that humans are unlike other animals in that their skeletal, there's a mismatch between the humans and their skeletal dimorphism and their body mass dimorphism. If afarensis scaled, if it had the match between its size dimorphism and its skeletal dimorphism, like an ape, then it would imply that it had very strong size dimorphism, less than a gorilla, right, more than a chimpanzee, you know, 70% or so maybe, plus or minus a few. But that's pretty substantial. If they're like humans in that pattern of that relationship, then it would imply that we have a human-like pattern of body mass dimorphism. So that whole argument there that I was trying to get across is that we're, the, the, the crux of this debate is going to come down to what does that skeletal dimorphism mean in terms of its body mass dimorphism. The argument over the measurement of the linear dimensions of the skeletal dimorphism, there are methodological issues with these things, absolutely. But, the, but for me, at least, the, the real problem that we're getting down to is what does that actually mean in terms of the size dimorphism? The, well, it could be. They could not. It might be that they are not dimorphic, right? There's, why not? You know, it's, it's the, it'd be kind of cool if that's the case. It would show that, you know, these things had evolved a unique pattern of dimorphism in association with Ardipithic. It would change our story. But if there are, um, that would also change, well, the only other evidence that we have about these things to try to make a decision is life history and development. We don't know why human, there's a dissociation between the human skeletal and mass dimorphism. This is a problem that really has not been addressed in the literature. It's kind of new. And uh, to think about it in these terms. But if these things are like apes in their life history, and this stuff is related to life history, then I would favor saying it's ape-like, because they're like apes in most other regards for the moment. On the other hand, if you can show that they're human-like in, in other aspects, then it would be more reasonable to assume that they show less dimorphism. Now, all this stuff that we talk about, about provisioning, you have to keep in mind here that we're talking about six million years. So a lot of times, as we are talking, myself being guilty of this too, we'll be talking about features that could be present in Homo neanderthalensis, or Homo sapiens, or Heidelbergensis, or Erectus, or Afarensis. It may be that all of this stuff is mosaic in its evolution, that certain features show up at one time and another time. So for example, the modern human of provisioning, we all agree, humans provision, right? That's true. It's absolutely true. So the argument is when, and how are these things actually related? Size dimorphism is an important component of that. But that mismatch between the skeletal and the size dimorphism comes down to whether that thing was human-like or ape-like in the pattern of the relationship. I have a slightly different answer for that. But, but Mike pointed out the key problem is that there is this mismatch between the 
the relationship between uh, mass dimorphism and skeletal dimorphism in humans versus what you see in chimps and versus what you see in gorillas. And so what that means is, in applying this method, I don't really care what the mass dimorphism is. I'm only measuring skeletal dimorphism, and I'm only comparing it to skeletal dimorphism in other primates, in chimps, humans, and gorillas. And what we've shown is that given the range of skeletal dimorphism in humans, it's relatively easy to resample from a human population and recreate the range of variation you see in Australopithecines, whereas it's difficult from a chimpanzee-like sample, and it's difficult from a gorilla-like sample. And so given that, Australopithecines have a different pattern of skeletal dimorphism than chimps, than gorillas. And in fact, I do think there is actually some uh, biological um, you know, relevance to what skeletal dimorphism implies in that um, the, re the way most gorillas become more dimorphic is that males actually have a longer period of growth than females do, and they actually grow for a longer period of time. Chimpanzees appear to have mature at about the same time. And so maybe there's this m intermediate level of human maturation, human similar, more human-like maturation in Australopithecines uh, that's not gorilla or chimpanzee-like. Matt, it, it may not be clear to everybody here what we're talking about when we talk about the difference between skeletal dimorphism and mass dimorphism. And, and, and it's a very interesting point, which biologically, which maybe we ought to make uh, as clear as possible. What we're really talking about is that in, in human beings, if we've got a male and a female of the same skeletal size, the female weighs more, okay, because the female has more body fat. And this is not seen in other mammals. Is that correct, Mike? Am I? Am Almost, I? yeah, it's, it's, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the same skeletal size, it's, it's slight mismatch, yep. Yeah. Okay. So same, fight, yes. Okay, same, yeah. <laughs> yeah. okay. Yeah. there may be some small point I'm, I'm missing here, but if we have a male and a yes, female that are the same skeletal size in, in human, the female is going to weigh more on the average yeah. because females have more mass per unit of bone than males do. And, and this is not seen because they have more fat. They have you know, more subcutaneous fat, uh, less visceral fat, but who's counting? Uh, <laughs> Uh, they have breasts, they have larger deposits of fat elsewhere. Uh, and this is, a, this is not seen in non-human primates, or indeed in, in, in non-human mammals, as far as I know. The only other animals that I know of that have uh, uh, dimorphism and body fat are orangutans, right? That uh, males will beef up a bit. But that's through the flange. Well, the guys, the flanges have flat, and is that what you mean? Yeah, we, we, we dissected yeah. an orangutan, and it was just absolutely amazing, the mm -hmm. amount of fat that this guy mm -hmm. had. Yeah, but he was a little obese, though. So, right, I mean, yeah, some of that was, yeah. And then uh, 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 squirrel monkeys, will yeah. males will fatten up during the mating season to look bigger. It's basically a cheap way of not having to keep that body mass all year round. And as far, but as far as we know, other animals are effectively lean, but there are no data. On these things, mm -hmm. so it's it's you it's just sort of gut feeling from what we see in the wild, but nobody's actually measured it, so it's it's not known. I don't know of any other differences between males and females are in, in the body composition. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Adrian Zillman did yeah. some studies, some pretty she good. Yeah, good. she did you know good studies, but the problem that the studies uh, you know there are there are some uh, tissue composition differences, but the problem that she faced is that those were captive animals and right. with age differences, and so that you know she, there's nothing she could do about it, but you know report what she found. So. How you interpret that is, has to be qualified with, with the sample. So it's an intriguing. It's an in, so so assuming this is a human peculiarity. Why is it a human peculiarity? That's the sixty-four thousand dollar question. That's. Do uh, you want to say what I said this morning, or that I mean? Yeah, it, sure. Because yeah. <laughs> some of these people weren't here this morning. <laughs> um, there, there's there's two I. Two things you'll read about. The first one is that uh, males have a uh, greater upper body strength and that the male lean mass is bigger than the females. When I say lean mass, that's your mass without any body fat on it. And you can measure that using an MRI, actually. It's a big study by Wang et al. in 2001. And uh, um, the idea there is that males have this lean mass dimorphism because they're physically stronger than females. And so selection has favored physically stronger males. The alternate, which has not actually been discussed, is that maybe what you're dealing with here is if body mass, total body mass, is optimized to the environment, then females have small skeletons and small body uh, muscle mass that they're giving up lean mass in order to increase their body fat. And the idea there is that you know, the, the, the lean mass dimorphism argument makes the uh, assumption that that body fat is effectively irrelevant 
that you just carry it around. But if you take two people who weigh 100 pounds and then you tell one of them that they're going to have to carry around a 20 pound pack that also happens to be metabolically expensive to run, even though it's not as expensive as brain tissue, they are going to have to eat more every day. Now, if you need body fat to reproduce, and modern human females do have to have body fat in order to, to ovulate and reproduce, if you have to accumulate that body fat and you're living out there in the wild, that means that you now have to not only meet your daily energetic requirements if you weigh 100 pounds, but now you're going to add on 20 more pounds to have to just build up the body fat to reproduce. So you're putting a metabolic burden on yourself to reproduce. You have to eat more just to get to the point where you can reproduce. So if there's an optimized, optimized body mass, what if the female simply is losing size in the muscle mass in order to make up the yeah, difference right. for the body mass and the tissue composition? In which case, then it's not that the male's getting bigger, it's that the female's getting somewhat smaller in tissue composition, but not in overall body mass. So now that's an idea that, okay, it's interesting. And uh, if there are other ideas out there, let's kick them around because but that, this, is a, this is a fascinating problem that really hasn't see, received a lot of attention. But that, but that um, difference, sex difference in fat stores, you know, which is now, you gave a lot of examples of, of primates where it's male specific and humans it's female specific. And that probably is a big part, you know, within modern humans that we agree are provisioning with short yes. inner birth intervals with, with overlapping offspring with, with basically making effective litters. I think we are a all lot in of, agreement. A lot of that, that fat source is probably there to reduce the inner birth interval to allow, possibly yep. to allow for you know, the, the extra nutrients needed on the mm -hmm. load of, of, mm -hmm. of this almost constant uh, pregnancy that <laughs> well, the, Yeah, and this is, this is fitting in with models now that are kicking around the, you know, the communal breeding model, the humans as communal breeders that uh, Sarah Hardy and Carl Van Schaik and other people are, are, are pushing very elegantly, and that is that we're kind of like marmosets and that human females cooperatively breed in order to bring in enough energy to, to support this high inner birth interval. We reproduce at a fast rate. That's modern humans that do this. So when we talk about the Australopithecines, the argument there can be rephrased as, when did it come about? Right? We're not arguing about what modern humans do. That's intriguing, and I think that the origin of this and the biological meaning of it, there's things that haven't been thought about about it, but we're in total agreement on this stuff. The actual argument goes back to the fossil record is when did it come about? So, mm -hmm. yeah, the, the body fat in the females is mostly drawn upon for lactation in terms of the, yeah. the reproduction, but, all, but it's interesting, too. To, I think we really need more data on the on uh, living primates, too, to see if, like, orangutans, because, of course, other apes also need need um, fat for reproduction, females do, but you know, humans definitely have a fast reproductive rate, so is it, does that explain it? Also babies, that human babies are fat, eight babies are not. That's a really big difference. And humans in general are fatter compared to other primates, even like, you know, kung bushmen have a, are fatter than, you know, even foragers. So there's lots of interesting things about fat. <laughs> Well, and it ties into brain size, too. Exactly, uh, right. Yeah, and the, the, the big argument, too, is about... Brain in reserve. Yeah, exactly. Reserve. And, and body fat in babies, maybe, exactly. is about the brain. It's lots of interesting yeah. ideas yeah. there. So let's take another question. Uh, yeah, Andrea. I, I have a um, brief question. Um, I was thinking, um, Australopithecines with Garhi started using tools, right? Making and using tools. Um, going back to canine dimorphism, um, what it meant, uh, why it developed, how does the, 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 the usage of tools, making tools and, 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 and using tools factor in uh, the, the, the canine dimorphism reduction, um, modification of the, of the dimensions of canines mm -hmm. in this sense? Well, does, it, does it have anything to do at all? Is it too recent uh, of a development uh, I mean, tool usage? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, that calls back, I think, to many of, I mean, like Darwin I think commented on this as well, as well but uh, uh, he wasn't blessed with the fossil record that we were. But, um, you know, uh, Gari, you know, is relatively late at, at two and a half million years, and canines have substantially reduced by then. But, of course, you are you know, to some defense, you are seeing the manufacturer of stone tools. Australopithecines could have been using stone tools before that, just not manufactured ones, so they wouldn't show up in the, in the, in the archaeological record. And probably early Australopithecines were probably using some form of non, um, you know, tools that wouldn't, wouldn't preserve in the, fossil, in the fossil record because apes and other apes use tools. However, the counterpoint to that is other apes use tools. 
and um, you know any trait that is something that you know is also something that an ape does that a chimpanzee does doesn't help us explain the evolution of a unique human character and so that that, that tool use that might have occurred early on doesn't seem to be correlated with canine reduction I, yeah, I agree. Yeah. I mean, so. <laughs> well, I think it's a, a agreement is a good place to end, <laughs> I think. Um, I, I want to thank uh, Cheryl and Matt for your contributions. I particularly want to thank uh, Kay and Matt for organizing this. And most of all, um, thank you, Phil, and thank you, Mike, for a really interesting conversation. We're going to be sticking around for a while and can answer your more questions. Um, I believe there, there are some beverages and, and food over in the next room. Uh, for those who are interested. And, and as you heard about today, there's a whole bunch we don't know. And that's really wonderful and exciting for the future generation of biological anthropologists, many of which are sitting right here. So thanks, everyone. And um, we'll be here to answer your questions. Thank you.